we're continuing a series called Faith to See. Somebody say, help me see. Help me see. Faith to see. Hey, I want to acknowledge just a couple of people in the room. Uh, our ascending church from Mobile, Alabama, Day Spring Baptist Church. Come on, we got a little whoop in the front. Come on, Cindy. Uh, a little over um, three years ago at this point, almost four years ago now, uh, Kristen and I went to the leadership of our church in Mobile, Alabama. We said, God is putting on our heart to start a new church in Las Vegas, Nevada. And that church was so incredibly gracious. I don't know if you know this, but some churches work just like the business world. And then you say you're exploring something else. They, they say, well, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. And uh, <laughs> that one's for free. You can have that. <laughs> um, and uh, Dayspring couldn't have done anything uh, further from that. They said, let us help you explore this calling. Let us support you along the journey. Let us, let us send you um, on this journey. And so they sent us along with the Eads and Julianne and Michael. They sent our team out here uh, to plant Favor City Church. And they're here today. Can we give it up for Dayspring? And uh, Pastor Clay and Pastor Matt, I don't know, you're, you guys are all on the back. Pastor Clay is a student pastor. Pastor Matt is as well. Uh, these guys are rocking it. Uh, leading a great team of teenagers here this week to bless our city. Honor you guys. Honor Day Spring, our ascending church in Mobile. Wouldn't be here without it. We are ascending church. We send because we believe that God has more for us than we could ever imagine. And that is God's mechanism for allowing you to experience more in your life. I'm telling you today that today's message, are you, are you ready for today's message? If you're ready, say I'm ready. I don't believe you yet. If you're ready, say I'm ready. God's mechanism for getting more out of your life than you could ever dream, ask, think, or imagine is by putting you in a position where you're saying, you can have my best. That I am going to send, I am going to be open-handed with my resources, with my time, with my talents, and my treasure. And when you say yes to his plan for your life, he will blow your mind. And so if you're ready for that, again, say I'm ready. Ready. When I was uh, a freshman in high school, anybody remember those wonderful years of your life from seventh grade to ninth grade? Just, just beautiful years of your life. And as a freshman in high school, we, I played as a football player, and we used to go to this camp every summer. Our football team did. It was called Camp Tempucci in Tempucci, Florida. And we would do summer practices basically on the beach in full pads of football. It was horrible. It was the worst experience of my life. It was not a whole lot of fun. In freshman year, our first year, so I'm, I'm coming into my freshman year, uh, my dad was, had a reputation because he was a college football player and uh, and, and so he had a good reputation of being a good football player. And how many of you know if you're a son of a good football player, they're expecting you to be also a good football player, right? And why are you laughing? Like I'm going to say I'm... <laughs> I don't understand, man. You guys are supposed to support me. You're supposed to help me in this moment. And so they, they said that, you know, we get to Camp Tempucci, Florida, and they did their best to make it everything uh, like Remember the Titans, just as miserable. They're getting us up in the middle of the night, making us do up-downs in the sand and all of that stuff. And we had a freshman field, and then we had a regular varsity field. And so at first I'm on the freshman field, and then I hear this sound from across the field, I hear our coach say, Gibbons, get over here. And so I run over to the, to the varsity field, and they put me in at middle linebacker because I guess they just, I don't know if they wanted to test me or humble me. I don't know what they were trying to do in that moment. But in, in my mind, I'm like, this is my shot. This is my moment. And there was a guy, he played fullback. His name was Zach Spears. He was six foot two, 225 pounds. I was six foot two, about 103 pounds. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm at middle linebacker, and they run three plays straight up the middle, back to back. And every single time, Zach Spears put his helmet right here, and my butt hit the ground so hard that I'm still recovering. <laughs> I mean, he every, just time after time, I would just bam, bam, 
bam, and then three plays in a row. And then they said, all right, Gibbons, you can go back to freshman <laughs> field. And I did the walk of shame, the jog of shame, all the way back from the varsity field to the freshman field. And I committed in that moment, whatever I had to do in the weight room, whatever I had to do at practice to be ready next time, I was going to be ready. Here's the thought for us as we start today. If God parted the sea, if he opened up the clouds, if he gave you the opportunity of your dreams today, if he allowed, if he said you can start that business, if he said you can pursue that career, if he gave it to you today, would you be ready? Would you be ready? Because I think a lot of us live in the fear of what happened to me as a freshman. A lot of us live in the fear of what happened to me where I, I got my name called, but I wasn't ready for the assignment. I, I got my number called, but I didn't have enough pounds to complete what they had put me in there to complete. I got my name called, but I just wasn't ready. I titled today's message, When God Calls Your Name. When God Calls Your Name. Somebody tap your shoulder and say their name and say he's calling you. Come on, let's talk today. Let's talk today. It's not going to be a monologue. This is going to be a conversation. Say he's calling you today when God calls your name. Because here's the reality. Most of us either miss or are hesitant to God's calling on our lives because of the emotional moments that freeze us in our tracks. So I want to ask you again, am I ready to answer the call? Am I ready to answer the call? The call, if God put before you very clearly everything that you've ever prayed for, and you could see very clearly today this next step that he's calling you to take, are you ready to say yes? Are you ready to take that step? We continue in John chapter 20 today, and where we left off uh, two weeks ago on Easter, last week we took a little break and we had baptism Sunday. Come on, wasn't that an exciting week last week? Hey, because it was such an exciting week, we're actually continuing it this week. We have four more baptisms today. Come on. Isn't that amazing? Where we left off on Easter Sunday was Mary Magdalene discovered an empty tomb. She discovered where Jesus was buried and the tomb was rolled away. And before she ever even had time to go in there, she freaked out. She ran and she went and got Peter and John. And they came and they discovered the empty tomb. And, and where we left off on Easter Sunday was that John, by, the, by just seeing the evidence of where Jesus had left, believed that Jesus had risen from the grave. But this is what they did, verse 10, John chapter 20, verse 10, it says, Then the disciples went back to their homes. And we know that by, uh, for the, the text that we're going to cover next week, we know what they did. They actually went back to their homes and they locked their doors because they were scared to death. <laughs> They were like, Jesus may be alive, but we are still scared to death. I, I may know what he's calling me to do, but I am still scared to death. Anybody been there? They, they are scared to death. They go, they run, they lock themselves in their house, but they left Mary in uh, by the tomb. And now what happened is Mary had run to the tomb. She discovered the empty tomb. Then she ran to go get the disciples. Now she ran back. And so some commentators are like, by this time, like she probably got left in the dust and she's probably up there. And they're not concerned with keeping Mary with the pack. In fact, it's noted that whenever she came to the disciples with that information, they just thought it was idle talk. They just thought it was an idle tale. It was like, that surely isn't happening. This is just Mary making something up. And so it, it, we know that they actually didn't take Mary. Mary super seriously and so they left her at the tomb and here's the posture of Mary st sitting at the open uh, standing at the open tomb but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb and as she wept she stooped to look into the tomb so Mary is is standing outside the tomb the disciples had left they were gone they locked themselves in their house and she's standing there outside of an empty tomb where she thinks that this tomb has been robbed by grave robbers. She thinks that, that the, the Savior that she walked and talked with, that, that she had developed a relationship with, that she had become so fond of, not now, not only has he been crucified, but his body has been desecrated. And so she's standing and she's weeping. Now this isn't just like um, 
This isn't just a moment where Mary is uh, in a corner and just kind of silently sobbing. Let's, this isn't the picture here. You see, when, when Easterners mourn, it was more of a wailing. Like it was a serious emotional outburst. Like she was completely losing her mind. But really some, some would say in the best way. She was displaying everything that she felt like had been took, taken from her Savior. She was displaying all that mourning and all of that emotion right there outside the tomb. Wealthy people would actually do this. Wealthy Easterners, when, when a loved one would die, they would pay people <laughs> to come to the funeral and cry loud. <laughs> Some of you are like, where did I get that job? Like, that sounds good. Like, <laughs> I can give blood or I can go, go, go cry loud or, you know, it's just like just a little extra side hustle, you know. Uh, but they would actually pay professional mourners to come and to cry at their funeral because they believed that that was honoring their life to to just to express that amount of grief super loud so she is being super loud this is not a restrained shedding of tears this is a noisy lamentations that would have been typical for easterners of that day but here's what you got to realize about mary's relationship with jesus mary was rescued from a deep dark life Mary was actually, scripture tells us that, that Jesus, when he found her, she was demon possessed and he cast seven demons out of her. That Mary was known for living a life that was full of sin. Mary had been rescued from the depths of her depravity from, by Jesus himself. And not only that, he didn't just rescue her, he invited her in to his inner circle. That, that she was there walking and talking with the disciples. She's right there with Peter and John. She, she was right there in the inner circle of the disciples. So she wasn't just rescued. She belonged with this crew. She had friendships with this crew. And so she was deeply, deeply grieving by Jesus' grave. And then this is what happened, verse 12. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at his head and one at his feet. Now, I don't know about you, but this probably startled Mary, but we don't get a whole lot of commentary from John. Then he says this, and the angels, they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? So she said to them, I don't even know if I would respond to an angel if it talked to me. I'd be like, ah. You know, she says she just doesn't skip a beat. She says, they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. So she's still convinced that this is a grave robbery. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. So she encounters these angels, and then she turns around, and she sees Jesus standing there, and she did not know that it was Jesus. Now, I want you to understand this. The significance of Jesus appearing to Mary first is something that we can't overlook. That at this time in culture, the, the, the oppressed and, and specifically women, would, their voices would not have been counted as a credible witness. Not only that, but Mary had a rough life. She had a rough past. And so people obviously weren't taking her seriously. So the fact that Jesus appeared, to the most broken, marginalized, oppressed woman in his whole group. He appeared to her first is one of the most noteworthy parts of this story. That he comes first to the poor in spirit. Matthew 5, 3 says, blessed are the poor in spirit for they will what? See God. They will inherit the kingdom of heaven. This is a truth that will never change. Now despite her failure to recognize Jesus... It's important that we understand that Jesus recognized her. That he validated her part in the story. That he saw her as important enough to appear to her first. So he appears to her and then Jesus said to her, same thing that the angels said, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And then supposing him to be the gardener, remember she's either in the garden of Joseph of Arimathea who lent his tomb to Jesus uh, to be buried. And so they're in this garden, so she's supposing that this is the gardener coming around to check. And, uh, you know, her eyes are probably full of tears. I don't know if she's making complete eye contact. We can't super judge Mary for not being able to recognize Jesus in this moment. After all, she's still convinced he's dead. 
And so she's, she is emotional. Her eyes are just full of tears. And, she, and so she, he, Jesus says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, you know, because likely here's what she's thinking. Okay, well, this, this rich guy giving us this tomb was obviously too good to be true. This rich guy giving us this tomb for Jesus was obviously too good to be true. They let him stay in there, but they're getting this problem off of their property. How many of you think that God's blessing isn't going to last? How many of us think that God's blessing, and how many of you think that it, the best that was ever going to happen in your life, the best days are behind you? I think Mary was convinced of this. I think Mary was convinced that their best days of following Jesus were behind her. And so she said, if you've, if you've taken his body somewhere, please just tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. I will give him the proper burial that he deserved. Now Mary was admirably obsessed with giving Jesus a proper burial. But she's talking to Jesus and she doesn't even realize it. And right now in this moment, she was so blinded in her grief that she couldn't even recognize that she was talking to the one that she was seeking. And one word changes everything. One word changes every part of her perspective. One word cuts through all of her grief. One word cuts through all of her pain. Jesus said to her, Mary. Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. One word in the midst of her tears, in the midst of her grief, in the midst of her pain. She's like, just tell me where you've taken him and, and I'll take care of it. I'll give him the proper burial. And he says, Mary. And you've got to know in this moment, I just, I just can imagine, if you would allow me to use my imagination a little bit, I just, as she hears her name, I just think time maybe stood still for her in a moment as she's flooded with the personal emotion of realizing, I know the sound of that voice when it says my name. I know the sound of that voice. I know that comforting voice that pulled me out of the darkest moments of depression in my life. I know that comforting voice that called my name when I was bound up in sin. I know that comforting voice that called me out when everybody else cast me out. I know that comforting voice. And when he said my name, I said, Rabbi, teacher. Now, the English or even the Greek translation of this Aramaic word doesn't do it justice. Rabbani was the most intimate of terms for a teacher, for that disciple or for that relationship. She's saying, you are my teacher, you are my rabbi, it is you. I know you personally when you said my name. Now, Oxford University study, this is a hard shift, but Oxford University study says this. I want to put this quote on the screen if we can. Evidence from n numerous numer uh, neurophysiological and psychological and brain imaging studies has suggested that hearing one's own name in an auditory task showed great advantages, faster and more accurate responses in various stages, including perception, attention, and memory. Why do I say that? There is power when you hear your name. There is power when you hear your name. Now, odds are if you say the name Joseph in this room, then several people will respond because that, is a, that seems to be a common name in, in this place. But uh, uh, there is power when you hear your own name. Now, you know, well, there's one group of people on the planet that didn't need Oxford University to figure this out. That's, can we give a shout out to the mamas in the room? Where are our mamas at? See, mamas... They, they figured this out for centuries. In fact, they realized this. If I add the middle name, I can really get your attention. If I hear Cannon in my house, then I know he may not listen. If I hear Cannon Blake, then I know somebody's in trouble. Right? If it, growing up, if I heard Joseph Riley, I knew somebody was trying to get my attention. And there's something about your name that makes you turn your head and give your attention. Mamas didn't need Oxford to help us figure this out. And honestly, this is, this is something that is hardwired into the DNA about the way that we respond to our name. Jesus has a unique ability to speak exactly to who you are because he made you. 
And our name is a powerful representation. It speaks to the core of who we are and it wakes us up. What happens when God calls your name? What's he telling you to do when he calls your name? There is now, I want you to write this down. There is nothing more powerful and more personal than the voice of God. There is nothing more powerful or more personal than the voice of God. John, John tells us earlier in John chapter 10, the shepherd has called his sheep by his name and the sheep heard and joyfully responded. When God calls your name, something has to change. I want you to know his voice is powerful enough to break the chain of addiction. Listen to me here. His voice is powerful enough to break the chain of addiction, but it's personal enough to walk with you through withdrawals. Listen, his voice is powerful enough to defeat death. It's also personal enough to walk with you and hold your hand during grief. The voice of God is powerful enough to sympathize with you in, in loss and provide for you. And it's, and it's personal enough to sit with you in devastating loss. It's powerful enough to change your world and it's personal enough to know your story. What happens when God calls your name? Jesus said to her, this is the response. It's a wild response. It confuses commentators. But I think we can see the heart of God right here in a powerful way. Jesus said to her, don't miss this, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, go to Peter and John, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Listen, write this down. God will never call you to settle for what was. You want to hear the voice of God in your life today? You want to know what he's telling you to do today? You want to know what he's leading you to do? You want to know the step that he's calling you to take? Some of you are paralyzed by fear and you're frozen in the past and you're convinced that your best days are behind you. And I'm here to tell you today that God will never call you to settle for what was. What Mary's doing right here in this moment is she's expressing all of her love and all of her emotion and she is clinging to his legs because all she wants is to go back to the way it was. And Jesus is like, listen, there is something so much better that I want you to experience. I'm not calling you to settle for what was. Yes, that was a great season. Yes, that was a beautiful season. Yes, I rescued you out of darkness, but I got an assignment for you that's bigger than your past. I got, I got a calling for you that's not confined to what you've experienced in the past. I've got something for you that will change the world around you. And you've got to let go of what was so that you can experience what is in your life. Don't tell me that God doesn't have more for you. Don't tell me that he doesn't want you to experience more. You've got to hear the voice around you, the voice of God around you, to step into what's next for you. But am I ready to answer the call. Am I ready to answer the call? I remember when I was preparing for college, uh, right after high school, uh, we had gone through a significant change, uh, a significant um, event in our church, and we had lost our pastor to a sudden death experience. It was really a crazy season, and a lot of leaders were stepping up in different ways. And I remember it was one of the first significant ministry assignments of season that I got. And in this season, our youth pastor was gone as well. And so my dad was appointed the youth deacon. So that meant that he had to get the youth speakers. So guess who he lined up to be the youth speaker? <laughs> You're up, son. <laughs> and so he, he, he tells me to go, to, to go speak to the youth. And so I'm speaking to the youth, of which I was one of them. And I remember it must have, it felt like there were 500 people in that room there were probably 15 but it felt like that room was packed to the brim and I'm just telling you I don't know what I said <laughs> I don't have any idea what I preached about the anointing fire didn't fall from the sky I don't think anybody got saved I think everybody was confused all right like and, and listen in that moment I remember thinking what in the world am I doing but for some reason God just continued to bless our ministry and we continued to, to to just take the next step and do what God was calling us to do and we hired a new pastor and that pastor came to me the summer before I graduated and went to college and and he said listen I want you to 
stay here and I want you to lead the youth ministry. And he offered me a job and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I already had plans to go to the University of Mobile and continue my education and, and, and pursue ministry. And, and my dad looked at me and all of the wisdom that he had and he said, you don't need to stay here for your assignment, for this assignment. You need to go step into something more. And it may seem like this is great, but you need to go get trained. You need to go step into this season at this university. You need to pursue this degree. What I'm telling you is this, is that sometimes the voice of God to you comes from voices around you. And if you want to clarify where God is leading you, you've got to see past what you just want right now in the moment. You've got to see past what's attractive right now in the moment. You've got to see past just these current little affirmations of what you, makes you feel. It made me feel good to get offered a job. I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't ready for it. And what Jesus will always know, he will, always, he will never let you settle for what was. He will always push you for, to what will be. He will always push you. But if you're ready to answer the call, the question, am I ready to answer the call? If you're ever going to answer that with confidence, then you have to put everything on the table. And to understand the heart of Jesus and why Jesus is telling Mary to let go, we have to remember what he had already told his disciples about their future calling once he left. He said this in John chapter 16, verse 7. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. Listen, Jesus was preparing his disciples all along the way. It's actually better. It's going to be better when I leave. You know why? Because I'm going to give you the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that raised me from the grave is going to be the same Holy Spirit that lives inside of you and is pushing you into your next assignment. This is what Jesus is actually pushing Mary to experience. He's pushing her towards the moment of Pentecost. He's pushing her towards Acts chapter 2. He's pushing her towards a bigger assignment that she doesn't even know is waiting for her. And listen to me. Some of us are, are just clinging to past comforts and they're not even bad comforts. But you're clinging to your faith in a previous season. Listen to me. Don't miss this. Some of you are complacent and you're missing God's calling in your life right now. You're clinging to the comfort of your faith in a previous season. And Jesus is looking at you. He's calling your name and he's saying, let go. Let go. I got a job for you. I've got an important assignment for you. I'm not telling you that I'm going to leave you. I'm going to go with you. But you got to let go of what was. Because we got to keep growing. We got more to do. We got more people to reach. You got more people to tell your story to. Listen, Jesus called her, her name. Culture would have cast a different lead. A corporate would have picked a different face. Mary was the unlikely, but he called her name. He called her name. Come on, somebody say, he called my name. Say it with me. He called. So come on, say it a little better than that. He called. He called my name. Listen, God doesn't want somebody else to start the business. He called. Oh, you got to do better than that. Come on, we're preaching together. He doesn't want somebody else to start the business. He called. Come on, he doesn't want somebody else to love your neighbor. He called. Come on, he called your name. He wants you to disciple your kids. You want to fish them off, but he called. Come on, he called your name when he gave you those children. He called your name. He doesn't want somebody else to serve in the church the way that he's calling you to. He called. Come on, you said it. He called my name. He doesn't want somebody else to start that ministry. He doesn't want somebody else to move into that next assignment. He doesn't want somebody else to go to the mission field. He called. He called your name. He has a job for you. He has an assignment for you. He has a career for you. There's a business he's called you to start. There is a person he's called you to reach. And you're clinging to the comfort of a past season to keep you from God's, from experience, God's blessing when you say yes. And here's the biggest thing that's hanging you up. I'm not qualified. I'm not qualified to do it. I don't have what it takes. I don't, I don't speak eloquently. I don't. I don't even know how to start a business. I don't know how to disciple my kids. I don't even know how to walk with Jesus myself. And 
but yet he's calling your name. Can I just encourage you with this? A mentor encouraged with me years ago, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies those he called. He didn't call you because you're ready. <laughs> We're, none of us are ready. Every single one of you are that wimpy freshman that I was getting called to the varsity field. And Zach Spears is going to blow you up in the hole. <laughs> you ain't ready. Come on, somebody say, I ain't ready. But he's made you ready. He'll make you ready. He will qualify you along the way. He will give you everything that you need. I want you to write three things down. You want to confidently hear the voice of God. I want you to write these three things down. If I want to confidently hear the voice of God. Are you ready? Don't miss this. This is the most practical thing I'm going to give you today. I want to confidently hear the voice of God. Then I need to be in the word of God. You want to know what God's voice sounds like? You better read your word. Some of you are so confused, you don't know if it's God or the, or the, or the soup that you ate last night. Like, you, you're just, I don't know what God's speaking to me because you don't know his voice. You don't know the sound of his voice. Mary knew the sound of his voice. So when he said Mary, she said, Rabbi, I remember what that sounds like. You need to know the word of God. Write that down. Number two, you need to have the people of God around you. You need to have the people of God around you. I don't know where I would be if God did not put my father's voice in my life. I'm blessed in that way. He was walking with God, and he could see what I couldn't see, so he could say what God led him to say. You need people that are walking with God around you. Some of you, grandma says it this way, if you lay down with dogs, you get up with fleas. But Proverbs says it this way, if you walk with the wise, you will become wise. So you need the word of God in you, you need the people of God around you, and you need the spirit of God inside of you. Listen, you know this, that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, when you've said yes to Jesus, lives in you. You know, the same resurrection power that gave Jesus the ability to walk right out of that tomb is the same resurrection power that will walk with you into your next assignment. And you will hear God speaking to you. You will hear God calling your name. You will hear God moving in your life. You'll hear him say no when you want to say yes. And you're like, well, I'm going to trust you. You will, you will have him illuminate things in your life. And you'll be ready to answer the call of God. But I'm telling you, you won't know his voice if you're not in his word. You won't know his voice if you're not around his people. And you won't know his voice if you're not walking with the spirit. This is why we pray the way that we pray. This is why we take time to intentionally pray the way that we pray every week. We say we, we're scripture-fed, spirit-led prayers in the corporate body. You need to hear other people pray. We need to be informed by the word of God. We need to be led by the spirit of God. And we need to be encouraged by the people of God. And listen to me. God has a big assignment for you. He's got a big calling on your life. And I don't want you to miss it because you don't know the sound of his voice. So if you're a believer in the room, I want to give you three questions to ask yourself. I'm going to invite the band to come back up, and we're going to, we're going to worship our way through God's calling in our life right now. Three questions. Number one, where is God calling me to go? Where is God calling me to go? It was verse 18, Mary Magdalene, she went and announced to the disciples. Here's what she said. She said, I have seen the Lord. And that he said these things to her. She delivered the message with confidence. She delivered the message with confidence, even though the last thing that she brought to her, they were like, that was just a tall tale. That's just, a, that you made that up, Mary. Anybody think that people won't believe you? Anybody think you won't, you won't, once you get into the room and you actually share your faith or you share your story or you do it, you think it won't work? Mary had to think that. But she was driven by the confidence of Jesus that he put inside her when he said her name. And he's calling your name today. And he has an assignment for you. Where is God calling you to go? Is it an existing field? Is it your workplace that you're in currently? Could be that he's calling you to get up and go right back to work at the same place with a new perspective. Where is he calling you to go? It could be a house that you live in. It could be a neighborhood that you drive past every... Where is he calling you to go? He might be calling you to move your family. 
He might be calling you to move overseas. He might be calling you to the mission field. I don't know where he's calling you to go. you got to work that out with the Word of God, with the people of God, and with the Spirit of God in your life. But here's what I'm telling you is he's calling all of us somewhere. God's call always has a geographical element. You know that? Every time God calls someone, he sends them in a geographical direction. Where is he calling you? We believe whenever we were exploring, I was asked this morning, why are you guys here? <laughs> what are you doing in, in Las Vegas? We grew up in Alabama. A lot of, most of our family is, is still there. You know why this is home? You know why we're here? Because God broke our hearts for this geographical city. We saw brokenness, and that was on names and faces and stories. But he sent us in a direction. What direction is God sending you? Where's God calling me to go? What is God calling me to say? He gave Mary a message. He gave her clear direction. He said, go, tell him that I haven't ascended yet, but I'm going to ascend. Check it out. Not just to my father, but your father. Not just to my God, but your God. He sent her with the message, message of an invitation. That he's going to a place that he's preparing for them also. What's God calling you to say? There's a message of hope you can take to your coworkers. There's a message of hope that you can take to your neighbors. There's a place of friendship you can create around your table. There's a message he's called you to carry. And listen, the same, you're like, it's all the gospel and I don't know how to sh share the gospel. Here's how you will most confidently share the gospel. You ready? Don't miss this. You'll most confidently share the gospel when it becomes real to you in your own life, your day-to-day -day life. If it's impacting you, if the message of Jesus forgiving you from your sins and giving you new life and giving you patience to walk, giving you resilience to lead your family, when that gospel message is impacting your personal life, you won't have any trouble sharing it because it'll be real. And you'll share it in your own voice. What's God calling me to say? Where's God calling me to go? What's God calling me to say? Who is God calling me to reach? From your neighbors to the nations, he's put face on, faces on your heart. He's put names on your heart. Where is God calling you to go? What is God calling you to say? And who is God calling you to reach? We say it all the time. This is, Sunday was our 62nd baptism at Favor City Church in the life of our church. Isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Only, only God. But every time we send out a praise report like that, I'm always reminded of this phrase that God gave me in our living room when there were six or seven people. Every number has a name, and every name has a story. God calls your name he sends you into a greater story he said Mary she said Rabbi he said hey, hey, hey don't cling to me don't miss don't miss what I have for you get up go to my brothers tell them I'm ascending to my God and their God I'm ascending to my father and their father and so she went with confidence and said I have seen the Lord and she told them all those things Where's God calling you to go? What is God calling you to say? And who is God calling you to reach? I had a mentor tell me, you never know who is waiting on the other side of your obedience. Somebody's waiting for your yes. So today, here's what I want us to do across the room. Maybe some of you have never heard God call your name at all. You don't even know what that means. <laughs> And today, he's calling your name for the first time. And you can feel that your heart, you need a relationship with God. That you feel desperate for purpose in your life and you need a fresh start. Maybe you're like Mary before she ever met Jesus. And your life has been dark. And your life has been bound by sin. Your life has been bound by bad choices. And so today, you need to give your life to Christ. So here's what I'm going to do. There's going to be some ministry leaders that are going to line the front of the stage. And as we close right now, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. 
And if you want a relationship with Jesus today, you want your eternity to be secured forever. You have the moment right now to hear him call your name and call you into an eternal relationship, a sense of security and peace with him forever. That's not shaken or bound by circumstance, but that is secured in the unpassing and the un and the, the all-powerful love of Jesus. So let's do this all across the room. If you want to bow your heads and close your eyes, if our ministry leaders, if you guys would just get in place here. Here's what I want you to pray. If you want to give your life to Jesus for the very first time right now, Romans 10, 9 says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, which means he's the boss, he's in control, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's confident, that's final, that's forever. So here's what I want you to do. Say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, I've messed up. I'll just tell him right now. This is called confession. Say, say, Jesus, I, I know I'm a sinner. I've, mi- I've missed the mark. I've, I've messed up. But I want you to be my Savior. He's faithful to forgive you right now. So just ask him, forgive me, God. Say, Jesus, I believe in my heart that God raised you from the express your belief in him right now. Jesus, I believe that God raised you from the grave. So today, pray this with confidence. I make you Lord of my life. I give you control. I want to walk with you forever. Okay, with every head still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that for the first time, would you just slip your hand up just so that I can celebrate with you. I see two on the right side, three on the right side there. Amen. If you prayed that, I see you, buddy. Four on the right side there. That's amazing. Anybody else? You prayed that for the first time today. I see you. That's awesome. That is amazing. Anybody else prayed that for the first time? want you to know. Scripture tells us there's no power in hell or on earth that can take away, take, that can take you away or separate you from the love of God. What you just prayed right now, your salvation is secure forever. You are eternally found in the home of heaven. Can we rejoice today all across the room for new life So here's what I want us to do. Let's all just stand together. Let's all stand together. Here's what I want us to do. If you prayed to receive Christ for the first time, welcome. Welcome to the family. We're so proud of you. Today we're having baptisms. That might be your next step. We have clothes. We have extra clothes and t-shirts and all that. You might want to get baptized today. It's a way to show on the outside what Jesus has done on the inside. It's where we go all the way under the water and we're brought back out and we're saying my, my, the old me is gone and, and the new me is here. And so maybe you want to follow him in baptism. Maybe you want to pray with one of these ministry leaders right now and say, I, I, I just prayed that but I need some extra confidence to know that I did the right thing, that I prayed the right thing and I need to process this. This is what these ministry leaders are here for. Maybe God is calling your name with a specific assignment today. He's placed something on your heart. You've been walking with Jesus and he placed something on your heart that was clear and you need to pray through and process that decision or maybe you just need somebody to pray over you. But whatever your response is today, whether you give your life to Jesus for the first time or you have a significant step and you want to pray through. To right now, the altar is open for us to just meet with God together and say yes to his best for our life. Can I pray for us?